I got a PhD as an anthropologist and was promptly unemployed. And, uh, but I'd done some work with computers throughout all of my uh, adult life. And so I got a job programming for uh, a company that had a, a NASA, that's the US Space Agency uh, grant, to do educational games using NASA data. And uh, so we're working on these games, which are mostly ecological games about climate change and uh, the sort of the global uh, ecology. And uh, um, we're going to give these away um, on, on disks to anyone who wants them. And I went to a software industry association meeting where they had a whole educational wing for educational software. And the teachers who showed up at that time, this was way back in 2001. They were all fairly dismissive of educational software because they'd been out of pocket for their, you know, their own money to buy educational software for their classrooms for the last 10 years. And this was back when a piece of software would cost hundreds of dollars. And uh, so companies were advertising these as revolutionary software products that would, you know, increase uh, classroom learning and, and be really effective. And they sold these to teachers who didn't have any money. Um, so it wasn't a happy meeting. I said, well, we're giving all these away because we're funded by the government. And they said, well, at least the price is right. But the next problem is why, why is educational software so horrible, just the way it's done? And uh, uh, so I say, well, you know, our games are pretty, pretty fun. And we try to introduce students to, uh, uh, to the topics in a, in a way that will engage them and teach them, you know, as high school students and junior high school students, how to use real data. We included an actual data engine in it that was pulling data from the NASA data centers into their computers. Um, and then one teacher, she looked at me, she said, you know, one of these days, someone will invent the educational game that changes everything. And then she smiled, she said, I guess I, I better not, you know, ask for that because I'll be out of a job. Well, I, it got me thinking, you know, why, why can't we put, you know, gaming at the front of sort of an unschooling of, of people to learn at home and learn through their computers in, in a way that engages them in real world, real life issues and actions. And uh, so uh, I, you know, I looked at the current technology. I didn't have enough money. I was not a billionaire, so I didn't have enough money to actually build the thing, but I wrote it. I wrote Junana, which is a novel about how uh, technology in you know, the year 2000 could have been used to create um, you know, an online experience available in multiple languages uh, across the planet uh, for free and, and basically take uh, students in their teens uh, through a college experience on their own and with each other without the need for schools. Um, so uh, I created a, in the book, there's a, a, an imaginary university so you can get a degree um, and it's a, a place where you can, uh, you can gather with people. And uh, it's, uh, it's based on the, the notion that we, we have a lot of knowledge coming out of our experience living on the planet, but we haven't found a way to encapsulate this into a vocabulary of experience and know-how. And <clears throat> if we can do that, and I think design patterns, which is the, what I used, I call them templates, um, could, could forge a new epistemology that would work uh, across the planet and, and because it's localizable for everyone. And everyone can add their own knowledges too. So it's, it's multicultural um, and multi-generational. So um, the book came out and, uh, you know, and it's, I, I made it available uh, for free uh, to people and several thousands of people have taken it from uh, the Internet Archive and other places. And, and I, I got great feedback. Finally, people say, well, what what happens next? Because all these kids are are now 
smarter than their teachers and smarter than the marketplace. Um, so I wrote a couple sequels about how they created a, a, a global win-win economy and, and just sort of e ejected capitalism and, and came to their own economy um, in a commons, really, and, uh, and, and with lifelong learning. So that's, that's sort of the fictional uh, ecoversity that I, that I created. At, at the same time, I've been working with open science organizations. So, um, of course, the open science movement uh, across the planet has been, uh, I think, originally a, a response to the expense of publishing science research uh, in a for-profit world. It usually has to be funded by libraries. Libraries get charged enormous fees for thousands of journals. Um, that they, you know, they kind of have to subscribe to be to be a, an academic library, um, and uh, so, and the and the publishers use secret deals uh, and packages to sell these journals to libraries, and and basically uh, the libraries have to pony up the money. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're in, you know, uh, California or Kolkata. It's a, you know. They're going to charge you enough money so that they make an enormous return on, you know, on their investment. The publishers do, and of course, people write the stuff and give it to them for free, the research, and then people come in and review it for free, and people volunteer to be editors. So uh, there's there's uh, tens of millions of hours of volunteer time that go into. Uh, the, the process, and then the publishers come out and charge you, uh, you know, thousands of dollars for a subscription. Or if you want to read it and you're not a subscriber, you can pay $35 for a single article. Um, of course, there are, uh, so the, the, the first part of open science is how do we fix that? Uh, uh, and, and opening that up so there's open access, anyone can read your article, um, real cost accounting for uh, you know, sort of commons-based publishing. Uh, I, I'm personally, I helped found a, a preprint service in the earth sciences called uh, Earth Archive. And we published uh, over 2,000 articles for free, and they're available for free in earth sciences. And there are dozens of, of these uh, preprint services around, um, adding to, to access. And so every, every uh, you know, Every day, a thousand or more articles are put into an open system now. So that's really happening. The next thing is uh, source open textbooks too. So how do you, you know, people go to uh, community colleges and uh, they can get free tuition, but then they have to pay a thousand dollars a year for their uh, textbooks. And that's, that shouldn't be happening. So, um, and the third thing is, um, Getting together as teachers and researchers in a commons, so that we can uh, we can build collaboration on the on the internet uh, across the planet and make it more equitable. Um, so I uh, I've been working with organizations like Force Eleven and the Research Data Alliance and some others to uh, to help realize sort of the cultural social side of things. And I wrote the Open Scientist Handbook, and, and that's available for free. And there's a large part in that on, on uh, building the uh, scholarly commons across the planet. And I think that's really the future of doing uh, research and sharing uh, for, uh, for higher education.